All right. Um, good morning, everyone. It's September 24th, 2021, just after 9 a.m., and you're joining us in the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz Metro. Uh, I'm Supervisor Bruce McPherson, the Vice Chair of Metro that is filling in for Donald Lynn, uh, Chair, um, who is at a League of California Cities conference and is in a meeting as we speak. Uh, so we will carry on. Uh, please call the roll. Okay, Director Dutra. Okay, uh, Director Colin Terry Johnson. Present. Director Smith. Here. Director Lynn is absent. Director McPherson. Here. Director Myers. Director Pegler. Here. He was here. Uh, Director Peterson. Here. Director Rothwell. Here. Director Rotkin. You're muted, Mike. Oh, Mike, you're muted. That's hard to believe. <laughs> Here, sorry. <laughs> it's Officio Henderson. He just Here. had a birthday. <laughs> uh, you're muted, Dan. Here. And ex officio Northcutt. Here. And did we have any other board? I don't think we had any other board members. No. Okay, we do have. We do have a quorum. Uh, is Director Dutra on? I know he, he didn't answer. Is he on now? Okay, well, we'll, we'll move on. Um, okay. We'll uh, just like to uh, mention that uh, today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. We thank them for their, their uh, joining us. Um, we'll go to uh, the next item, number four, for Board of Directors comments. So any comments from the Board of Directors? See. Seeing none, do we have any oral or written communications to the Board of Directors? Uh, no written communications have been received. Okay. Item number six, uh, labor organization communication. Uh, anything from labor organizations? Mr. Chair, I think we have somebody in the um, attendees Oh, Donna Myers is in the attendees, has her hand up. Okay, board of directors comments. Uh, so is there a way to let Donna Myers in as a panelist instead of in the... I'm in now, thank you. Okay, sure. Sorry, I'm late. Please let me, yeah, I'm sorry. I, uh, yeah, I was stuck. So I'm it's here, thank you. It's understood. Do you, do you have any comments going back to on the agenda? Do you have any, any direct comments? I do not, Chair, thank you. Okay, um, we were a uh, labor organization communication, I believe. Uh, is there anything from labor? I'm concerned, hands. Yeah, you don't see any hands there? No. Can I, can I ask how many people are in the non-member um, or non-participant um, group? It's a lot of people. There's seven in there and um, several of them are um, employees. Actually, almost, I think all of them are employees. I, I wonder if it's possible to have them show, you know, shown or entered or something into the group, or is that a technical problem? Just seems like, you know, it's a public meeting. They, we could see them and their reactions to things and stuff. Or I don't know if we have a policy about this. Mike, do you have a participant's uh, logo down at the bottom of your screen? I do. And oh, if you I see. click you. that, you that'll show their that. names. Thank yeah, you. And then, and then that, you can that's... toggle between two pa panels, <clears throat> one is a panelist and one is attendees. I see it now. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, uh, does anybody, you satisfied, Mike? I don't think anybody has a comment. So. Apparently not. Uh, and the Metro advisor, the MAC, written communication, anything from MAC? Uh, nothing. Oh, okay. Um, okay, we have uh, any additional documentation to support the uh, agenda? There is none. Okay. We will move to the uh, Consent agenda items nine one through nine ten. Um, 
Is there any comments from the board? Uh, no, seeing no comments from the board on the consent agenda item. Uh, anybody in the public would like to address us on an item that's on the consent agenda? Items nine one through nine ten. Nobody move, move approval of the consent agenda. That Second that. Agenda. Very good. Um, Rodkin and Pegler, call the roll, please, to approve the consent agenda. Oh, wait, is there, I asked about public comment. Okay, go ahead. Okay, for a rope call? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Director Dusev, still not here. Okay. Uh, Director Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Uh, Director McC McPherson? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Peterson? Aye. Director Rothwell? Aye. Director Rockin? Aye. Okay, we have a uh, motion passed. Motion passed unanimously. Okay, we will go to item number 10 on the regular agenda, the first item on the regular agenda. Um, we went to uh, we have a resolution of appreciation for a Martin Gilbert or Marty Gilbert, also known as Marty. Has he's been a devoted, hardworking employee. Uh, Marty has been a pleasure to work with, especially when he was uh, there was a demand for extra help. He always stepped up to cover and never had a passenger complaint. Never. Uh, you could always count on him as an easygoing personality with a great sense of humor, and even at the end of uh, the today behind the wheel. Uh, Marty always went out of his way to accommodate his regular passengers by making uh, them their connections uh, with them and their to get to their destination safely. He has enjoyed traveling, uh, his vacation hopes, uh, and he wants to uh, do much more relaxing as he can uh, in his retirement. He expressed he has a great uh, he's had a great career with Metro and is grateful to be able to re retire in this community. He and uh, he and his wife are looking forward to traveling even more. So uh, thank you, Marty, for your tremendous um, service to Metro, Santa Cruz Metro for so many years. Uh, we do appreciate it. Um, I, the resolution, I do believe, needs a motion. We'll move its approval. I'll second. Okay, all the roll, please. I'm sorry, who made the motion? Botkin made the motion. Okay. And the second was Larry? I made one. Okay. All right. Dan actually did it, but it's, it's okay. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Was it Dan? There's no self-esteem involved in that. <laughs> it's the internet, actually. All right, Dan, it is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, roll call, Director um, Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. <laughs> Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. Director Rothwell. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passed. And thank you again, Marty Gilbert. Uh, item number 11 is consideration of approving the authorization to engage a municipal advisor, bond council, and bond underwriter to move forward with the issuance of a pension or obligation bond. Uh, Chuck Farmer, our chief financial officer, I believe will present that item on our agenda. Yeah, thank you. Um, can we pull up the presentation? I think it's slide 44. There you go. Got it. Okay. All right. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about, uh, you know, one of the things that came on is we have you know, a physical cliff coming up, you know, in 2027, give or take, depending on the nature of how we do, you know, financially over the next few years. And one of the things we want to do is kind of leverage down any outstanding problems that we have uh, that, you know, mitigate risk as well as hopefully bring down payments so we have less money going out. 
And two of the big items that I've actually been in discussions in the last two uh, finance and audit committee meetings um, over the last two months is talking about pension and OPEVs. So this is our pension plan and the fact that we're underfunded as well as not being funded at all in our OPEB plan. So if you go to the next slide, so I'm just gonna go quickly through um, the pension piece as well as our recommendation and what we're gonna try to do going forward. So let's go to the next slide. So right here, we analyzed um, our look at pension and our post-employment uh, benefits. And our pension, our total pension value right now, as of today, uh, is 192 million, of which 128 million is funded, and we have about 64 million dollars that's not funded. On our OPEBs, uh, we don't pre-fund that, so we pay as you go. So that's basically we're paying every single year as, as we uh, pop through. So if we want to go to the next slide. We looked at this between pension and OPEP. And one of the things we try to do is one, mitigate the risk, and then two, look at it from a standpoint of what, where we could save the most amount of money and quickly first. So by going through and comparing between pension and OPEP, OPEP is pay as you go. So regardless of what healthcare goes up or down, we only pay for that in year. There's no, penalties or interest or anything associated with future payments. We only pay, like I said, as you go. However, on the pension, it's a different story. In the pension, CalPERS runs a projection of what we need to fund pension for all the employees today that are retired, as well as employees today who are currently active. And they look, they forecast that in the future as to what we're gonna end up paying, and then they say, well, we're going to discount that back based on what we expect we're going to return every year, which in this case is 7%. And they say, okay, here's what you need today. So that's that full amount, $192 million. And currently we have a hole, we're short, $64 million. So CalPERS looks at that $64 million and says, well, if you don't have $64 million, we can't earn the 7% that we need. So we're gonna charge you that 7%. So each year we get charged 7% on that outstanding balance because we have to make up for what they should have been returning on their, their funding. So this year we're gonna pay $5.1 million um, because we're not, we don't have that money in there to pay. So if we, so when you kind of look at pension 5.1 and you look at OPEBs, whatever the healthcare, Whatever healthcare we use for that year, whether it's retire for the retirees, that's what we pay. So if healthcare goes up, then we pay a little bit more. If healthcare goes down, which it never does, we pay a little bit less. But we that's a pay as you go. We're not penalized for the future. So we're focused right now the the cover of the pension portion only right now, because that's the biggest impact we can make, and we'll cover OPEBs at a future point in time, once we get a little bit of experience behind what we're doing in pension. So if we flip to the next slide. So as part of this uh, Chuck, process- Before you go on, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, the, I, it's not gonna affect in the end my support of what you're proposing because I heard about it in our finance committee, but I, I, it's a philosophical question that you can help me understand. Mm -hmm. When, when, CalPERS charges us this interest and penalty for not having uh, totally paid our pension obligations into the future. That's, as you said, on the assumption that if it, that's as if everybody that works for us right now retired tomorrow or today, and we had to like give them a pension, boom. So in other words, we shut down business and all the other members of being uh, of the, the, uh, the, the, the CalPERS system did the same thing. So, I, I'm not asking you to defend this or in any way, but could you explain what's the logic of why we would, since that's not going to happen, people are not going to, you know, the entire CalPERS industry, you know, people subscribing to CalPERS are not going to shut their business down tomorrow and leave. What what's the rash? What what rational do they give for basically? There may it's a way for them to cover their current costs, you know, other than by their investments or 
setting rates on what it actually cost to pay people out this year. What, what's the logic of asking all of us to put money, give them money for a, a bill they're not going to have to, uh, they'll pay it someday, but then in the meanwhile, they'll be getting more money every year, though more stuff will come in. What's the logic of asking all of us to pay into the future for a bill that's never really going to happen in that way? What, what do they argue? What's their, what's their rationale for sucking that money out of our, you know, direct service? So, so let me, um, I, I need to correct you a little bit. So oh, please, that 192 million is what you need in today to pay future obligations of pension. So for example, like me, if I have to, re if I'm going to retire in 15 years based off of their piece, they take that in consideration that I retire in 15 years. It's not that everybody retires today. It's that it's people who retire in the future. So based on their longevity, retirement age, and so forth of that nature, they take it and then they say, okay, all right, this is how much I'm going to pay for Chuck in the future. How much do I need to have at the point in time when they draw it down? And then they discount that back 7%, assuming that this is how much money we need today. So if we were to like freeze the pension and say, that's it, we're no longer going to you know, count more years of service towards anybody. We're going to freeze it today. We need to earn 7% every single year. And then Chuck retires. Now we can start paying them and we're still returning money, you know, 7%. And then I go all the way to when I die, when I stop taking pension. Okay. So as part of it, that 64 million that's sitting out there, that's not funded right now. So CalPERS looks at that 64 million and says, well, we should have 64 million in there and we should be earning 7% so that when the few, when, as people start to retire, we can use that money to start paying them. If we don't have, if we're not paying the 7% on that $64 million, then ultimately that 64 million is actually going to start growing in the future and become bigger because we're not paying it. So when people start retire, we're going to have to come out with their own money. Part of, I'll just say the majority of the reason why we're sitting in this hole of 64 million is because of the investments that were made in the past by CalPERS. And because CalPERS is almost, I hate to say, it's kind of like shielded in the fact that they make investment policy decisions, they invest, and regardless of how the market comes out, we are on the hook for their returns. The difference so, between the 7% they were expecting and what actually happens in the real exactly. world. Exactly. So if they outperform, that's great. That benefits us. But if they underperform, then ultimately we're on the hook to make up that gap. And that $64 million really kind of started to really show up when we had the housing crisis in 2008. When everything tanked, they actually had negative returns and all the balances that we had in there went the opposite direction when effectively we should have been getting 7%. So, and so it, that so it's not the whole amount they're paying. It's not the whole amount that they need right now to pay you when you retire in 15 years. They need to be earning the 7% on that total larger principal. And that's Correct. the issue that's going on here. That's exactly it. So the 192, okay. we're actually going to pay out a lot more than 192 because we're getting 7% on that every single year. Right. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. You know, Mike, thanks for asking the question on this convoluted system that is very difficult to understand. And we have little responsibility for it directly, but uh, it is what it is. So we just have to work with it the best we can. And I know you know that too. No, and I appreciate getting that response. It, it's, right. I, I like to understand that we're, that it's not like we're just paying. I mean, the, the, the failures of, P, uh, of the investment are not necessarily even CalPERS fault. I mean, if the market, goes up and down and they make their best attempt to do, you know, I'm, let's not have a discussion today about whether CalPERS is doing a great investment job. It's just that that's the reality of what's going on. They're projecting seven and they don't always make their seven. Yeah. 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 Mr. Farmer, if we, if we don't, if CalPERS doesn't make that 7%, we get penalized for it. We right. have to make up for that difference. That's correct. Right. And where you see the difference is going, it's going into that 64 million. It'll go up if they miss it. If they, achieve over it, then that 64 million will come down. Got it. But even, even if they make their 7%, we're still going to be paying interest and penalties on the 64 million that we're not, not, uh, <laughs> that we're yeah. not covering right now. Okay.
Yeah. Okay, so um, as part of this, we went through different alternatives. So if we go to the next slide, because we want to see how can we go about fixing this $64 million gap and not paying these interests. So if we move to the next slide. So we looked at, you know, adding discretion, you know, additional discretionary payments into our pension plan. This is above and beyond what we're currently playing today. We looked at a section 115 trust. We looked at, of course, pension obligation bonds. We looked at uh, a Calipers Fresh Start program. And then also looking at leveraging assets that we have here that we fully own and possibly going out and leasing them and then taking that money to pay down. So that created a whole bunch of problems because of uh, the money we received from the federal government. So five kind of came off, but we wanted to let you know that we looked at it. So if we move to the next slide. Uh, wrong way. So what we... Okay, so all right. So right now, our recommendation after kind of going through this process, we looked at different returns and so forth. We're looking at a pension obligation bond. So um, this uh, agency actually did one-year notes back in mid uh, 1980s up to like the early 1990s to cover in-year cash flow problems, and they were up to about three million dollars. So we actually have done somewhat of a bond. It was just a one-year note. Um, so in this case, you know, this is not something new, but it's been a long, long time since we've done something. Um, so what we're looking to do is basically cover the full outstanding balance. Now, asking for the full outstanding balance and actually getting approved to kind of go forward with a bond at that amount, you know, is, is questionable right now because we still have to go through a whole bunch of other hoops and hurdles, but at least that's what we're going to try to shoot for. We're going to try to shoot to cover everything. Um, and at the same point, too, the, the goal here is to um, reduce our liability or our, our discount rate or, or interest rate, which is basically right now, CalPERS was at 7%. They're now at 6.8. And in November, they're going to possibly reduce that to 6.5. So to kind of give you an idea, if the discount rate, this is where I talked about, you know, future payments discounted back because they expect to return 7%. If they reduce that number, that 64 million is going to go up because we'll need more money today because they're going to earn less money in the future. So that 64 million will grow if that discount rate goes down. So we're on the hook to cover even more money. <laughs> All right. So based on this and based on talking to a bunch of experts, right now, very, very conservatively, we are estimating a pension bond of about three and a quarter percent. That is basically 3.75% lower than what we're paying at 7%. Um, so if you move to the next slide, the big thing here is the advantage is lower interest rate of 3.25. And it also, as part of the pension bond, we get flat payments. So for 15 years, we'll pay the exact same amount of money regardless of what happens out in the market, whether we go to a recession or expansion, those bond payments will be exactly the same for 15 years. Very easy cash flow, very easy to manage. You know, the big disadvantage here too, we're going to take that money and we're going to stick it into our pension. And it kind of goes back to our earlier discussion. Um, if we put that money into POBs, they're going to expect a return, whether it's 6.8% or 6.5% return which whatever it ends up being, if they return less, we'll have to make, we'll again, have to dig ourselves out of a hole, but the hole will go from zero to whatever that hole is. So it could be $500,000. Likewise, if it goes the other way, we could be overfunded in our pension. So that has its own little give or take issues if we continue down a path of being overfunded. So like I said, that's one of those things where, you know, we got to, we're still kind of on the hook for that. So if we go to the next slide. So now I'm going to talk about just the financial. So you kind of get an idea of why we picked it. This is the payment curve that we're going to pay today if we do nothing. So right now, starting the blue, the $5.1 million is going to raise by 2031 to 6.9 million. This assumes that they're returning 7%. 
you know, so if it's below 7%, it's going to go higher, this, this curve. At the same point, this also is based off of current retirees and employees today, or actually in this case, at the end of, of um, 2019. So as we get new employees on, if we expand you know, operations, this curve is gonna continually to grow and grow farther. So it's gonna get worse. So as you can see how big it is. So if we go with the bond, flip to the next slide, the blue is basically if we did a 3.25 bond, we would be paying just over $5 million for 15 years, effectively lower than what we'll pay over the next 15 years if we stay at our current rate. So we have that savings. The red dotted line is basically the, bump, the way we would pay today and the blue would be the bond. The yellow shaded portion above the blue bars, as well as over to the future years is all pure savings. And that savings right now is estimated about $36.9 million that we would have to pay. So if we go to the next slide, we'll show you the dollars. So right now we currently have, like I said, the $64 million. We have to still pay that back. If nothing changes, there's still that 64 million gap that we have to pay. The real key is, how much of the interest on top of that do we have to pay? Under the current scenario right now, assuming 7%, we're going to pay another $54 million in payments for a total of $118 million. Under the bond, we're only going to pay $17 million or $81 million. That's where we save $37 million. And just to kind of give you an idea about how conservative these, conservative these numbers are, so Santa Cruz County just went out with a $124 million bond um, like a month ago, and they got 2.4% interest. I'm doing this on 3.25. So I'm not saying we're going to get to 2.4, but 3.25 is very well in that realm of being very conservative. So that savings is going to actually increase even more the sooner and faster we act, re we react to doing this. And at the same point, I think, if you watch the news this week, I think it was eight out of the 16 Federal Reserve members voted to accelerate the interest rate increase from 2023 into 2022. So when they start to signal that, that means interest rates are going to go up. And interest rates go up means our bond interest rates go up. And we want to get there sooner than later to get this thing out the door. So if we go to the next slide. So here's what I'm asking is basically looking as a, as the process goes forward is, is pull together um, a, a municipal advisor. So this is a person SEC qualified and they're the person who walks us through the process, a bond council, as well as an underwriter. And the underwriter is the last in the process. They're the, actually the arbitrator between buying the bond and then the people, bond, or the, they're the people who actually go and sell the bonds for us. And they're the middle person. We have to draft and reduce, uh, uh, review some legal documents. We also have to do some research on the SCCIC and how that plays in a pact with the agency here and what we can and can't do. Um, we got to draft a preliminary official statement. So this is the bond itself, what we're doing. We need to go to the ratings agency. That's the biggest key. We go there, they're going to give us our ratings and what we can actually go out with the bond. Once we get the ratings, then we'll come back to board for final approval on, and I'm going to use the word estimated rate. We will not know the rate until we actually go out to market because, you know, the market always is moving, but we're going to be pretty, pretty close at that point in time. And then, of course, the bond size, you know, is it going to be 64 million, 50 million, what, what that number is, and then the structure of it. And then after that, we're going to actually go out and price the bonds out in market, and then we'll get the exact back, and then we'll take the proceeds and pay off the pension. So you want to move to the next slide? Okay, so this is what, actually, I'm, I'm going to skip over these. You can read through them, but flip to the next one. I think it's two more slides. You can go one more. Okay, 
So what I'm requesting in order to kind of move forward with the bond, if we are in agreement that we want to save this 36.9 million or whatever the number is, is really the, the approval to, for, to assemble a team for this bond, bond placement. This would be going out and hiring a municipal advisor first and then a bond council. And then we have to do some of the legal work behind it. And then ultimately hiring an underwriter so that we can start pulling all this together. All the costs associated with these three would be rolled into our issuance of our proceeds from the bond when we actually go to market. So think of it as kind of like a mortgage. It's we're rolling their costs into the cost of uh, going out there and getting the, uh, the funding or the bond proceeds. So this is what I'm asking to move forward. And like I said, this is not asking to go out with a bond. This is asking to go through the process um, of figuring out exactly what we can and can't do and then get the bond out there to market as soon as possible. And I'm trying to push this as fast as I can because I worry about interest rates and, and a lot of talk about interest rates going up. Okay. So uh, does that complete your presentation? Yeah, I believe so, yes. And a very understandable one, thank you, under the circumstances of the subject we're talking about. It's as clear as I can see, and I think many of our local governing agencies have um, uh, faced this same issue and have gone ahead with a, a similar proposal to what you have presented. Are there any questions from the board of, about the bond, uh, the recommended action? Uh, are there any questions from the public Donna, do you see anything there? Alex? No. I'm not seeing anything. Okay. If there are no further questions, I want to mention that um, uh, Director um, Peterson from Capitola has to go on a work, a real work related item. Uh, so she's going to be not going to be here, but she said, wanted me to acknowledge that she was supportive of this recommended action anyway. So please call the roll, or excuse me, do I have a motion? Yeah, I, I'll be happy to move this. Let me just say that you're always at risk when you say something's a no-brainer, but this is about as close as it comes in terms of like, you know, otherwise we're just throwing money into a hole and then they, we get nothing from it that really benefits us. So even though it, it means we'll have to, you know, pay, make these bond payments and that comes out of our general fund, ultimately, I mean, our general you know, revenues, uh, we're, we're saving so much money in this over the next several years that it's, it would be really silly not to do it if it's a possibility. So okay. I'll move approval of this recommendation from staff. Very good. And I'd like to second, this is Shepard Calentari Johnson. Very well. And, ask, and I'd also just like to thank Chuck and the team for all the work to getting us to this, to this place. Thank you. Very well said. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. As I said, this is as clear as, as, clear an explanation as I can uh, remember. We have a good one at the county too, though. So uh, please call the roll. Okay. Um, Hi. Hi. But Anna, I think uh, you're, oh. you have to talk into the computer. We can hardly hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, Director McPherson. Aye. And Director Myers. Aye. And Director Pegler. Aye. And Director Peterson is absent. And Director Rothwell. Yes. And Director Rockton. Aye. Thank you. Motion passed. We're motion passing unanimously. Thank you very much again, uh, Mr. Farmer. Thank you very much. Uh, we go to item number 12, committee assignments uh, that was recommended by our chair, Donna Lind, who I, as I mentioned, she's not here today. Um, uh, do we just have the various committee assignments? Any questions from the board on those? Do we uh, any input from the public? This is for the next for next year. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could interject, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so uh, you you have um, with with the resignation of uh, Council Member Aurelio, um, you have seats that have become vacant that Aurelio was filling on behalf of Metro, and so you have to start the process again, much like you do at the beginning of the year in order to fill those two seats. And that's what this item does. And then um, the suggestions for those seats will come back to you next month and you would act upon that. 
And Julie, would you correct anything that I said that was wrong? That's all so, correct. So uh, to be clear, is this um, a really the, the Watsonville seat as well as well, the two Watsonville seats then? Is that what we're talking about? This is just the committee or the metro assignments. I got it. Okay. Well, got the it. city of Watsonville uh, will still take action on who their replacement will be to our board. That's a separate item. Okay. Now this this does need action today. Then well, uh, we're not a, we're not approving the actual people. We're still no. approving the process by which eventually Donna will make a nomination list and others can make another slate if they don't like what she proposes just like we do at the beginning of the year so all we're doing is saying yes let's start the process of figuring out how we're going to do the, figure out who's going to take over the committee assignments that Aurelio Gonzalez used to have very good yeah that's very well said um does this require a motion then yeah okay uh entertain a motion or let, any public comment that I asked for that already I don't I don't see any I'll move that we begin this process. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Please call the roll. All right. Director um, Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Director Conant. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pagler. Aye. Director Peterson. Oh, absent, sorry. Uh, Director Roswell? Aye. And Director Rockin? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll go item number 13, a uh, uh, oral report from our CEO and a COVID update. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Directors, um, I'll have a, again, like last month, a fairly lengthy report a lot has happened in the last 30 days there are things happening in the coming 30 days and then of course uh, a sizable discussion about what's going on at the federal level which is always exciting and its own its own novel all by itself um, at one point here i'll i'll ask uh, uh, general counsel julie if she'll step in to talk a little bit about some recent state legislation and, and then i'll come back from that and wrap up my report i'd like to start off with our new hires uh, we did hire a mechanic one, James Silenbinder, and a vehicle service worker, Abigail Lazaro. So welcome aboard to those two new employees. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about our uh, experience with COVID. So since you last met, we've had no new COVID positive cases. Actually, we have, we've not had any new COVID positive cases since September 10th to be more accurate. Um, we have had two presumptive positives. Um, those are not clear-cut positives. Um, and at that point in time, that did trigger a Cal-OSHA outbreak, and a Cal-OSHA outbreak is having three positives at a work location in a 14 consecutive day period of time. Um, however, those because they were presumptive positives, they did retest, both of those came back as negative. So we were able to actually reverse or retract within 48 hours our OSHA outbreak situation. So that went away, thankfully. Uh, and thankfully our employees did not have COVID. Um, relative to vaccination rates, most Metro departments are over 85% vaccination rate with the exception of purchasing the mechanics, the facilities maintenance group and operations. Our agency-wide average percentage right now is just shy of 83%, and that is up from the 75% that I reported last month. So the numbers are going in the right direction. Uh, relative to mandatory vaccinations, uh, last month we implemented a hybrid mandatory vaccination directive, very much similar to what the County of Santa Cruz did in which all vaccinated employees must submit to weak, unvaccinated employees must submit to weekly on-site COVID testing and must provide Metro a copy of their health care card. Let me just pause and double check because sometimes I have issues with the audio on this. Is the audio coming through okay? Here you find. Good to hear, good to hear. It's a good day. Yeah. Okay, continuing on. So to date, all employees have cooperated with uh, the directive, all unvaccinated employees cooperated with the directive with the exception of 
two unvaccinated bus operators. One has refused multiple attempts by Metro to secure a copy of his health care card, and the other has refused multiple attempts by Metro to get him to take the weekly COVID test. Now, again, these are two unvaccinated employees. So both employees are being processed for discipline as per MOU Article 1601, grounds for discipline and discharge, blatant insubordination. Uh, Valencia Labs program that is the program that we use for our on-site testing. Um, our, our, uh, and they've been providing us, us the kits, if you will, since about December of last year. And we had pending bills of over $115,000 for those tests. And I'm happy to report that since last month, uh, Margo has had a conversation with them uh, as, and Chuck participated in that. And we were able to negotiate for that entire $115,000 to go away. They're going to retract those invoices. And instead, we provide them all of the healthcare cards, copies of the healthcare cards for all employees who are tested going back to December of last year. They will bill the insurance company for uh, those tests and they then assume all the risk if the insurance company does not pay. There is no cost to our employees for that. So that's good news. It'll save us a good chunk of money. So thank you, Margo and Chuck for your hard work on that. Um, so going forward, staff is currently reviewing a new mandatory vaccination policy, which if it implemented will be similar to the San Francisco model or similar to the uh, Monterey Salinas model. That is unvaccinated employees will be given a certain amount of time to provide proof of full vaccination. Anyone not in compliance will be subject to discipline up to and including termination. Um, again, we're still looking at that, reviewing that, uh, contemplating language associated with that. But once we come to the conclusion that that's what we should do, we'll of course reach out to the unions and inform them and uh, they'll let us know what they think about that. Um, next, the governor, so moving away from uh, COVID, the governor has signed Assembly Bill AB 361, that's uh, Assemblyman Rivas' bill, which will allow the Metro Board and its standing committees to continue to meet via teleconference rather than in person. At the October regular board meeting, Metro General Counsel Julie Sherman will provide the board a resolution for the board to consider that will allow the board and its standing committees to continue virtual meetings. At this point, I'd like to pause and just ask Julie if she wouldn't mind commenting. Sure, thanks Alex. Um, yeah, by now you've probably all been inundated with alerts about AB 361. I, I know I get something, seems like every five minutes from a client or an entity telling me about this bill. Um, it essentially, you know, because those teleconference requirements of the Brown Act were suspended by the governor under his executive orders, those expire on September 30th. And so this bill is essentially carrying on that suspension, only it was adopted by the legislature and it was urgency legislation. So it went into effect immediately. Um, for our purposes, that means October 1st, it becomes you know, effective to us because we already have the executive orders that take us through September 30th. And so if the board wants to keep meeting virtually, there's a bunch of requirements in, that have to do with public comment and public participation, but you all are already meeting those requirements. Um, you know, there's certain things you have to put on the agenda about how the public can submit comments. You're doing all of that. And I will just continue to monitor and make sure that you're in compliance with AB 361's requirements. And the big change, well, the one thing to know is that AB 361 is only going to be valid as long as there's the state declaration of an emergency. When that is lifted, AB 361 will no longer be valid. Um, it also sunsets in 2024, which kind of gives you a, a sort of preview of that, that likely the state of emergency is going to be here for a, a longer time. Um, you know, obviously we're doing pretty well in the Bay Area, but in other parts of the state, 
there's areas that are not doing well. And since it's a statewide emergency, you know, the thinking is that it'll be there for a while. Uh, but once it's lifted, you can no longer have virtual meetings without complying with the teleconference requirements that we all remember and, and love so much. You know, you need to welcome people into your home and all of that stuff. Um, so you, you're pretty much going to continue, you know, if that's what the board decides, with the same procedures that are in place now. And the big difference is you'll have to make certain findings every month. And, and it's basically, you know, the board saying there's a state of emergency, you know, there's, there's local guidance on social distancing, and we're going to continue to meet, you know, through these virtual meetings. And you have to make those findings every 30 days. So every meeting, every regular meeting, it can just be on the consent calendar and I'll make sure that it, it complies with, you know, the findings have to be specific and I'll draft those. And then you just keep doing that as long as, as you want to and as long as AB 361 is still valid. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I, I think, um, first of all, I th I'd like to have additional direction to uh, write, a, write a letter to Assemblyman uh, Rebus thanking him for this bill. Uh, and my, my general feeling is uh, we're just doing fine in teleconference. I know there's, uh, I think we've gotten used to it. The public has, um, and uh, nothing else. We saved some miles traveled from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. Uh, I think it's a real positive thing for our agency, but uh, we'll come to that decision or later. But uh, if we could uh, just have some additional direction to uh, thank uh, Senator Rebus for his uh, bill AB 361. Bruce, or let me ask Julie, is it illegal for us to, to do that on the basis of consent? In other words, Bruce asked, is anybody opposed to that and we move on or do we have to actually have a vote? I, I think if you're just giving staff direction and, you know, it's not on the agenda to take formal action on, on that. So if you okay. just want to have, you know, Bruce give staff direction and no one's opposed to that, that's fine. So Bruce, why don't you just ask if anybody's opposed and then go ahead and do that because I think it's oh, a yeah. good idea. Very good. I, anybody opposed to that, uh, to, to write uh, Senator Grievous, uh, thanking him for this uh, legislation? I don't think we see any, we don't see any from, do we see any from the public? I don't think so. Good. Yeah, we'll be happy to do that. Good. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, is it okay to continue on? Yes, please do. Okay, uh, so continue on, on August 27th uh, in the afternoon, this was uh, actually the same date as your last board meeting, uh, we had several of our staff members had a virtual meeting with FTA Region 9 Administrator Ray Tellis uh, and his staff concerning Metro's request relative to our 2016 Federal Lono Grant. Um, Mr. Tellis expressed his support for our proposal that the FTA allow Metro to use the grant to purchase three, maybe even four, Proterra battery electric buses for our Highway 17 service. Now, you might recall that uh, we received the 2016 grant award uh, based on an application for Highway 17 that would buy three um, battery electric over-the-road coaches. However, since the award of that grant, uh, no bus manufacturer has been able to step up and provide a vehicle that will meet all of our needs in the over-the-road coach realm. And therefore, we modified our request so that we can meet all of the requirements of the 2016 with the exception of the over-the-road coach requirement. Instead, it would be a 40-foot uh, bus. It would be one of the buses we now own or a bus like what we own now today, which is the Proterra 40-foot. And as we talked about before, that bus has been tested uh, by Eddie and the team, and they feel very good about its performance on Highway 17. So the next step is, um, certainly that was, a, that was the most important step, was getting our Region 9 administrator to agree with our ask. Uh, he was enthusiastic about it, and now he reaches out to Washington, D.C. to see if he can convince them to make that slight modification. So that's pending. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, we'd like to place that order. 
Again, that that's a 40 seat bus instead of a what 60 seat bus? Is that right? Or is yeah, four? I think it's somewhere in that same area. Margo, is that about right? Yes, that's correct. It also doesn't have the um, luggage, you know, underneath kind of provisions that over the road coaches have. It probably doesn't have tables yeah. where people can at their seats either, which the over the coach over the road coaches have. Yeah, it still right. would have. I assume it still would have Wi-Fi, which is critical with so many people yeah. taking that commute. Yeah. Yes. And and we'll experiment. We'll we'll explore things like uh, um, you know charging ports for electronic devices. So those are all yet to be explored. Okay, good. Okay, and then moving on, the FTA is currently reviewing our drawdowns of federal COVID assistance. That's the CARES Act, the CARISA, and the ARPA. Um, this is a federal requirement. Um, they're not picking on us. It's a federal requirement. Anybody who's drawing down those monies must go through this audit, and that process will take approximately three months to conclude. Um, last month, we talked about our... our uh, Synchromatics contractor for automatic ve automated vehicle location and our smartphone application. And we have issued them a notice of default. Uh, Synchromatics is Metro's uh, provider of the uh, automated ve uh, vehicle location system. So the 30 days notice to cure has expired and the I our IT director, Isaac Hawley, and our general counsel are reviewing the work accomplished by Synchromatics over the last 30 days uh, to determine, determine what the next steps are. So I'll be able to tell you more next month about where we're going with them. Uh, turning to good news, of course, we had the ribbon cutting ceremony um, relative to Metro's new zero emission service known as the Watsonville Circulator. Um, that was September 7th. It was a highly successful event. Our speakers were Chair Donna Lynn, Director Dutra, Mark Hollenbeck from Proterra, and Congressman Panetta. And of course, the circulator went into service on September 16th. On September 8th, Metro we, staff... By the way, we should give Danielle uh, uh, credit for a, a wonderful event that really was well organized and well attended and really was, went off without a hitch. It was really great. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mike. That's uh, yes, she did a fabulous job. Thank you. And a couple of more things we're going to talk about that she's done here recently uh, to include on September 8th, we staffed a booth at the Chamber of Commerce Business Expo. Um, John and Danielle and, and uh, some customer service staff uh, covered the hours of staffing for that booth. Um, we also were able to take our Proterra bus to that event, which was pretty cool. And then uh, unexpected, but really cool, uh, John and Danielle were able to um, be interviewed by the KSCO uh, team at their booth live on the radio. Um, it was an extraordinary interview. They talked about the Watsonville circulator and hydrogen fuel cell buses. But what was extraordinary is the amount of time that they were able to be on the radio. It, I, think, I think they may have been on for up to 15 minutes. So we got a lot of airtime. Great, great. Um, and then we, this past week, we displayed our Proterra bus and Paracruise vehicle at the county fair in Watsonville. That was the 15th through the 19th. Um, we took that opportunity to distribute information about the new circulator, Watsonville circulator, and we provided the people with information about various Metro recruitments, including the current bus operator recruitment and the new sign-on bonus. And then HR will have a booth at the Access to Employment Job Fair, which will be held at the Coconut Grove on October 13th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. We'll be focusing on the bus operator recruitment as well as other current openings. Uh, moving on to other topics, uh, you recall for several months now, we've had a temporary reduction in fare. And of course, that ended on September 15th. We're back to normal fares. Um, and kudos to Danielle and Rena. They got our new online square store up and running. So if you go on our website and you look at purchasing Fair Media, uh, it is vastly improved. It is very professional looking. And that went online September 16th. I would encourage you to go online and take a peek at that. Um, as we look forward to that journey to recover, 
Metro's customer service windows at Pacific Station and the Watsonville Transit Center uh, opened full-time starting September 16th, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. They're closed for lunch and breaks, but this is a, a big improvement over where we've been for the last several months with very limited customer service hours. And then today, Metro is staffing a table at Pacific Station for downtown day, which uh, welcomes back students uh, to UCSC. So another, another little event that we learned about at the last minute, but Danielle and team were able to put something together so that we could be there. Uh, and then Metro's recruitment television commercial uh, that, that Danielle and the marketing department have been working on is in the process of being finalized. It'll be broadcasted on Comcast on English and Spanish channels beginning in October. Uh, there'll be three different uh, topics here. The first commercial will be the uh, hiring of bus operators and the hiring bonus or sign-on bonus. The second will be highlighting other uh, vacant uh, recruitment uh, vacants for vacancies. And the third will be encouraging ridership uh, people to come back to the bus and our splash pass and the Watsonville circulator. So uh, if you're a Comcast customer, watch in uh, October for those commercials. Alex, can I ask you, we're, we're I assume being covered by media here, what is that bonus and what's the initial um, salary if, if you have a ballpark figure for us? We have a great benefit system, but what's the actual initial salary for a bus driver and what's that bonus? Yeah, I'm gonna ask Don to chime in. Sorry, I was trying to grab my folder and unmute at the same time. Um, so the starting, um, the starting rate for a bus operator is, sorry, let me get my readers. 1997. And then after they finish their um, probation and get fully qualified, it's 500. Um, and then after probation, it's another 1500. And then after they work their first year, approximately 280, uh, 2,080 hours, then they receive another um, 2,000. So it's a total of $4,000. Great. And, and this job requires, I mean, at least to be considered for this job requires basically a high school degree and a clean driving license is that a, and, and a drug Correct. test. And a drug test. For a drug test and a um, background check. A clean we, drug test. A clean drug test. <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> we, of course, heavily screen for customer service. Absolutely. We can teach somebody to drive a bus. We cannot teach somebody to be kind and considerate and, you know, taking care of the public. So, so yes, um, our, our number one skill that we look for is customer service. Thank you. I think You're that's welcome. helpful. And hopefully some of the media might report that information. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'd just like to say thank you to our bus drivers because we get great com compliments, uh, comments from people about how kind and courteous they are. And it's really trying to turn conditions over this last year and a half, especially. So uh, I think it'd be great just to say how much this board really appreciates their courtesy that they've exhibited over the years, over this last year and a half in particular. It's really well received and much appreciated. I'm sure if I can add to that, I was on a... Um on a call with um, our clinic that actually handles all of our drug testing um, and now handles our workers' comp um, occupational injuries. And the manager that manages all three locations throughout Santa Clara, uh, sorry, Santa Cruz County, um, voiced how, um, how much she loved our bus operators and how being in that clinic is, you know, sh from patients and things that come in, she got all kinds of um, feedback about our bus drivers and how great they are. Great. So, yeah. Good. Thank you. Mr. Chair, before I continue, I think you have uh, Dan Henderson with his hand up. Don, can you remind me what the hourly rate for your bus operators are post probation? Post probation is. Uh, 2255. That's that's a month. I'm sorry. You know what? Uh, I was looking at the wrong year. So it's uh, 2375 after probation. 
2375 an hour 2375 after after once they become fully qualified okay thank you and then i think there's another pay bump uh right at about one year out right um after one year 2526 they they moved to step 3 and then I, i'll just give you the 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 top step 8 is 3306 Shall I continue? Sure. Okay. Uh, so really exciting news for us. This week, the FTA finally, underscore finally, issued the long overdue 5339B bus and bus facilities notice of funding opportunity, what is sometimes re referred to as a NOFO. And um, that we've been expecting actually since March. So it has taken them forever to get this done, but it is issued. And of course, we've been preparing for months to apply for this grant uh, in hopes of winning a grant that will build our new paratransit facility. Uh, the program that they put out is a $409 million competitive grant program. Um, what's also exciting is that it, that reflects $125 million plus up from last year. The applications are due by November 19th, and John and Wandamu and team have been working hard to get ready for this, and uh, they've taken the extra time to continue to refine that grant package. So we'll make that deadline, and uh, then we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope we get the award. I do want to give a shout out to the Bus Coalition. As you know, we are a member of the Bus Coalition. I'm actually, I'm actually a board member on the Bus Coalition. Um, but we can attribute uh, the credit for that plus up entirely to the bus coalition. They worked hard and tirelessly uh, and they did a great job. So thank you to the bus coalition. Last week, Eddie Benson and I attended a three day zero emission bus conference in Denver. <laughs> so we learned a lot about the current state of, of both battery electric and fuel cell bus technology. In general, fuel cell technology is significantly improved over prior conferences. Uh, it's getting a lot more traction these days, and more and more agencies are talking about fuel cell in the future and less battery in the future. Uh, so it's good that we're participating in these types of conferences and staying abreast of whatever the current technology movement happens to be. Now, out of that conference, Eddie came away excited about some things that we learned there about uh, pilot projects and, and the ability to fuel uh, a small fleet, say three to five buses. So we're going to explore trying to find some space on our facility where we can bring in this newer fueling technology. And uh, if we can do that, then next year in the 2022 low no grant cycle will apply for a pilot funding for the fueling and maybe three to five buses. So stay tuned and uh, um, we hope to be able to apply for the grant next year. All right, the next part is, is uh, the update on the Federal FAST Act and reauthorization and the infrastructure bill. This is the latest and greatest from our, our uh, federal advocate, Chris Giglio. So I'm just gonna read you what he provided. It's very thorough and it updates the information I provided you last month. <clears throat> so per a promise that Speaker Pelosi made with a group of House moderate Democrats last month, the House leadership continues to plan a vote next week on the bipartisan infrastructure plan that was approved by the Senate on August 10th. The bill includes approximately 1.2 trillion for traditional, underscore traditional infrastructure, such as transportation, water, broadband, and electrical grid improvements. <laughs> House leaders are working to schedule a vote next week. At the same time, on the $3.5 trillion human infrastructure bill. Several House committees approved various portions of that bill in the last few weeks, and just last night released legislative text of the 2400 page bill. That must be real interesting reading. It is. Those are great things to read at night. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you have insomnia. <laughs> exactly. 
So the human in infrastructure bill includes a variety of items not ordinarily uh, associated with traditional infrastructure, such as child care and elder care subsidies, affordable housing construction, job training, and expanded family and medical leave. <clears throat> the House proposal would also offset the spending with tax increases on wealthy individuals and corporations. While both infrastructure bills are likely to pass the House if they are taken up at the same time, the human inf infrastructure bill does not yet have the necessary support from all 50 Senate Democrats to pass. If House leaders do not bring the human infrastructure bill to the floor at the same time as the traditional infrastructure bill, a group of House progressive Democrats are threatening to vote against that traditional infrastructure bill. However, there is a chance that enough House Republicans could vote for the traditional infrastructure bill to offset the Democrat op opposition to pass the bill in the House, but it is far from certain that House GOP leaders would want to provide Democrats a win. While the fate of the human infrastructure bill is still uncertain and likely faces more negotiation between the House, Senate, and the White House, even if it were to pass the House next week, the state of traditional infrastructure bill is a little more clear. The traditional infrastructure bill passes the House next week. Uh, unamended, it will go to the president who would likely sign the bill into law. So that one, that one could get itself separ separated from the human infrastructure bill and, and could make it to the president's desk. Passage of the traditional infrastructure bill is also important because it includes a five-year reauthorization of the federal highway, transit, and rail programs, which expire October 1st. Meanwhile, um, the House this week passed a continuing resolution, or what we sometimes refer to as a CR, which keeps the government running in the absence of congressionally approved budget. The new fiscal year begins October 1st, and Congress is not close to finalizing the budget. The CR approved by the House would keep the government running through December 3rd. There's always a however. However, the CR will need Republican votes in the Senate to become law, but it is not likely the CR will get the 10 GOP votes needed because the CR also includes an increase in the debt limit, something Republican leaders have said they will not help Democrats with. Next week uh, is expected to be a bit of a crazy week up on Capitol Hill with the infrastructure, the budget, the debt limits, the cliffs all happening next week. So stay tuned. On the California front, you know, bringing all of this to closure here, uh, the first year of the 21-22 legislative biennium ended September 10th. Legislators have returned to their districts until early January when the second year of the session begins. The governor has until October 10th to sign or veto bills that are on his desk, including AB 418, Valadares, which Metro supports and which would require that special districts like Metro be considered for any future funds appropriated to help local communities build in resiliency against public safety power shutoffs. Josh Shaw, Metro's California legislative advocate, has conveyed to the governor Metro's support for that bill. And Mr. Chair and directors, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Um, any uh, comments from the board? Thanks. We probably know more about what's going on in Washington than anybody else in Santa Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, thank you for that thorough report. Appreciate it. Uh, any questions from the, or any other questions or comments from the board members? Any comments from the public? Don't see any. Okay, um, well, that concludes our regular agenda. Um, I was hoping to get this thing done in an hour, but it's almost an hour and 15 minutes. We gave it a couple anyway, so that's good. Uh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you, Bruce, that was great. <laughs> okay, uh, we will, um, the next meeting of the Santa Cruz Metro is October 22nd, 2021 at 9 a.m. It'll be, I'm sure, by teleconference. Uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, before you adjourn. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to make one, one other uh, announcement uh, under our next meetings. Uh, we are having a special meeting on Friday, October 8th at 9 a.m. at the Sea Cliff Inn, uh, 7500 Old Dominion Court in Aptos, uh, as well as 
the regular board of directors meeting on uh, Friday, October 22nd. So um, at this point, we are having, because this is a workshop, we're striving to have as many uh, of the board members in attendance as possible in person. Uh, we do understand that there may be board members that would like to choose to not participate in person, but virtually. Um, we're, we're going to be able to accommodate that along with public participation virtually. So that's all being handled by Isaac and John. Um, but we're, we, we think because of the nature of the workshop um, and our consultant agrees to the extent that we can have in person, we think that's really uh, more beneficial. Yeah, I do too. And I thought the, we haven't had a workshop for a little while now, but boy, it was invaluable before, especially when we were in some financial doldrums, uh, no fault of the district itself or the uh, uh, metro itself. But um, I think we really got uh, our plan of attack to where we're going to be going in the future and where we are. So uh, it's a, an invaluable uh, conference. I hope that one way or the other, uh, in person or uh, teleconference, that all board members will be able to attend that on October uh, 8th. It starts at 9, is it? Is it 9 or is it 8? It starts at 9 a.m. 9, 9 a.m. Uh, this is the first of two workshops. You'll have another one the second Friday of November that then brings us uh, to the revisions uh, and updates of our, our strategic, our business strategic plan. Okay. Thank you for mentioning that. Very important. I hope we see. Uh, all members of the uh, Metro Board participating. Um, any other comments uh, in my rush to adjourn? I'm, is there any other comments? Okay, this meeting is adjourned. We will meet October 8th in that workshop, uh, but the next regular meeting will be uh, Friday, October 22nd at 9 a.m. Have a good day. Have a good weekend, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce. Nice, job. Nice, nice job of chairing, Thank Bruce. You. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye.